Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Mills. I'm a senior associate at the Zen Group, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's FS Club webinar, where we're going to be discussing authorised push payment fraud. I'm joined by John Bertrand, the consulting director at ODPT, who has over 30 years' experience in banking and technology. As always, the agenda for this webinar is very simple. Following my introduction, John is going to make his presentation, and then we're going to move on to the Q&A discussion. Now, I'm afraid that you are all muted, but you are able to submit your questions to John through the chat tool to the right of your screen. Please do chip in at any point of the proceedings. I'm going to be collating your questions, and I'm going to put them to John at the end. As with all of our FS Club webinars, we're going to be recording this session and you're going to be able to access John's slides and presentation at a later date. Now, before we move on, I really must thank FS Club members who've opened up our webinar series to the public. With their help since March 2020, we've had over 300 of these events on topics as diverse as money laundering, the metaverse and high salinity agriculture. The FS Club is the premier global executive knowledge network for technology and finance, where members and their guests can meet over a glass of wine to debate key issues which impact on financial services, technology and society. Very much like a 21st century version of the city's 17th century coffee houses. And so, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Now, as well as sitting as director for three fintech firms, John is also the consulting director at ODPT. He has over 30 years experience in banking and technology at Citibank, FIS Global and SAP. And with DPA, he was responsible for the creation of the first EU directive on international payments. He's also a livery man at the Worshipful Company of Information, Information Technologists and sits on their security panel. John. Tell us about push payment fraud. Thank you, Simon, and welcome everybody. Yes, um, we're going to have a look at authorised push payment fraud, inoculation, and the curious resistance confirmation of payee. What you always must remember is the fraudsters to play this game must have a bank account. Uh, Peter, next slide. So what we're going to do today, <clears throat> we're going to cover why faster payments is the choice of consumers and fraudsters why faster payments is accelerated up to 70 percent increase year half year on half year in 2021 uh, what is needed to slow stop app fraud that now exceeds credit card fraud in the uk which is quite a milestone and then the summary even the markets don't believe we can carry on this way the amount of fraud that's taking place in the uk is astronomical uh, peter I thought I'd start with a, a fraud example. This is a, a, a real live one. Uh, it's Facebook, Airbnb, and the victim pay. Uh, a friend of mine saw an Airbnb ad on Facebook, uh, went on it. Yeah, it looks everything looks fine, and uh, paid paid away a thousand pound. Well, what happened was then the the advert on for Airbnb turned out to be fraud. So the uh, payer bank was asked to reimburse and was said well i'll see where the payee bank is it was told no money in the account refuses reimbursement they call airbnb who admired the, web, the, the fake website and said no we don't it's refusing to reimburse and facebook said simply said go call your bank it's a vicious circle now this person is smart savvy professional they're shocked and embarrassed and like 43 percent of the victims accepted the loss and feels deeply depressed the 40 43 percent comes from which 43 percent people say oh we we can't be bothered to to complain about it and uh, so peter the next slide so why is faster payments the first choice well you get your money in seconds it's now microseconds um, i don't know if you've been using your your card to to buy stuff sometimes it arrives before the merchant has time to authorize it it's really good technology is superb 
and it's a great for the uh, faster payments, great for this digital era. Money moves in seconds, it's not an issue, and uh, it's perfect for fraudsters. It's the, it's going growing fast, the 3.4 billion payments a year. And uh, the, uh, the numbers are staggering. The APP fraud characteristics, there's 50 million bank accounts bombarded by fake ads constantly. Um, if you've got a phone or email, you're forever getting them. Uh, one of the clearers believes that 10% of its client base had a, uh, was approached by a, a, a fake a scam which is an incredible number. Where the banks have had success is when they work together with the police, with the branches. Unfortunately, banks are closing branches. So even that area of success, where in 2021, they got close to 200 fraudsters, um, charged 200 fraudsters, that's going away because the branches are going away. So you've got to come back into the, the uh, crypto digital world and that's where we're going to go and live in the future. Now, unfortunately, banks blame their customers. And that shows in the reimbursement figures of 40%. And that was before the voluntary reimbursement program. Before then, it was 20%. So the bank said, oh, no, no, you gave the client your authorization. It's your problem. Now, unfortunately, Payment systems are designed for speed. Fabulous. Faster payments and swift is great, but they just do on sort code and account number. 95% of the banks and internationally 100% of the banks do not verify the ownership of that account with the ownership on the records of the bank. That means that I could put down Mickey Mouse or HMRC and say, oh, you please pay me. Now, one of the big philosophies is bank fraud really considered a crime. Now, there was a, the government said that, oh, crime has gone down. Yes, physical crime went down, but cyber crime has gone through the roof. Now, the problem is the police could only investigate fraud after it's happened. So the, the, the fraud has happened, but you, we've just said faster payments, the money is gone, it's gone in seconds. And also the police only want to do large frauds, very uh, over, over 50,000, which it way dwarfs the amount of fraud that, that it's, uh, the consumers are subject to at this point in time, or we're subject to at this point in time. Also, it's hard to connect emotionally with digital fraud. It, it's sort of not quite an out of body experience, but it's like, oh, Oh, it happened. Well, what, 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 what that happened? Uh, it, you, we've got to somehow tie that back into if it was cash. If it's cash, you'd be there like a fly, saying, "Oh, we can, we can do that. This, we, we can't do that." And uh, next slide, Peter. Now here is what's what's happening. The growth is really. If this was, if we were doing a fintech company, we'd get all kinds of money to to run this place because just look at the the curves and the the, the victims' losses, the, the blue one, which is in the centre. It's the banks, the ones that lose the least, and that's because of this ingrained. It's your fault. You, we are the good guys. You're the bad guys, and the chances of being convicted are slim. One hundred and fifty-one alleged fraud cases in the first half of 2021. Now, the financial obviously is the final appeal of banks and they overturned 70, up to 75% of the bank's no's against the customer. So the no becomes a yes. But the problem is the process and that process could go on for weeks and some have gone on for months. So it just weighs you down. If you, and, it, and it's a small amount of money, you know, you say, oh, forget it, right? It doesn't make you feel good. Now, the police recorded crimes of burglaries uh, of which 5% were solved, right? But with cyber, it's it's 0.2%, one in 500 are solved. So, and if you're a criminal, you're invisible. So why not go and do cyber crime, especially with the technology we have today? 
the police do acknowledge burglary is deeply intrusive and also so is being scammed you know Yeah. This uh, this is an interesting one because this is you know how do people get get into just bear with me a second. It's what what's happening is that uh, the frauds have a known pattern. Every bank holder needs to know the level of risk before making a payment payment to a new payee and uh, the fraudsters have known payment patterns i.e they get the money in and take it away also part of that pattern is that these fraudsters try and take as much possible out of your bank account as they can if they could take every penny they will now one of the for bank holders they've got to ask and prove who is the payee you know, who are you? And uh, 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 allegedly scam with uh, Jeremy Clarkson, this uh, immediate edge. And when you called the number, that number doesn't exist. You can't, you, you, you fill in and get an email, comes back to you, and then you're, you're then hounded. I set up a, an email account just to see if this was true or not, and it's not true. And the, the other issue is that when you pay over your 250 euros, and they are running on the credit card, which is interesting, and uh, you have to cancel your credit card because the international payments come straight onto your credit card. So you can't stop an international payment once you, you said go ahead. And since that day, I've had 14 emails. I've had about six phone numbers, mainly from Belgium and France, and also a number of uh, calls from Bangladesh. So it's it's not just a UK thing, it's an international thing. Now the tell companies know this is a common feature in scams, but you know, who's gonna attack that? Now the government and banks offer passive generic five point guidelines, and it, it's kind of, it's motherhood and goodness. It reminds me, I grew up in Northampton, and we had a, uh, a quarry which was filled with water and all that was there was a one post saying deep water be careful right and, and that's basically what's happening here uh, next next slide Peter. now the thing that uh, we must do have to do is mandate uh, confirmation of payee. There's only six banks, which although they make up 85% of the payments, use confirmation of payee. All the others do not use COP. So what happens is that the banks that do use COP must pay banks that do not use COP. And guess what? The fraudsters are moving to those banks, which is 95% of the banks, to set up their accounts because they because they could then explain to the uh, the uh, victim oh our bank doesn't do that well, so I, if the bank doesn't do it it could be okay and i've just a little diagram there that shows you the, the four outcomes of that so what's happening is that the the fraud level for non-cop is actually increased it's actually safer with doing transaction between the, these six banks because they both check everything but 95% don't do that. So the fraud has gone up tremendously on the, not the six banks, but the other banks, but the, 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 the banks that pay away, the liability is still unclear and it should go to the bank who set up the payee. The reason for that is supposed to know the customer and you're supposed to keep track of what the bank account was set up to do. And finally, the Payment systems regulator is looking at increasing the COP mandate to 14 banks. That's 95% of the payments, which is good, but 5% of the payments is still 125 billion a year. And here's my pun, and there is still a large fishing pool for fraudsters. So it's they can go into that. Um, Netherlands, 99% of the uh, banking payments in Netherlands use COP, and uh, their APP force dropped 81% since 2017. Uh, the 
UK Finance and Pay UK is working on a new pay data set that includes the amount of money being moved and compared to balance. Crowdsers will take it all. So, the next slide, Peter, please. So, what is needed to stop fraud? Well, they, it's a bit like COVID. All people need to be vaccinated and to prevent APP fraud, countermeasures are required, such as mandated regulation right, to, to use COP. Uh, banks to cooperate in multi bank research. Uh, what's, uh, because what happens is that the bank move, takes the fraud payment and then the fraudster moves it to another bank and moves it to another bank. So it's a network effect. So you've got to follow, follow the money and where the, the money is going to. Ultimately, the, the money will leave the country at some point. Owners of the bank account need to know the risk in paying a new payee in an active way. And that's the information. The person who knows about the payee is the bank because you've had to fill out all these forms and it's supposed to be ongoing. And it's a thing called know your customer and anti-money laundering. Both those regulations force people into, uh, it's gotta be active. And also the, the consumers themselves, the, they need to start recording the, the phone number, I know it's pain, but the phone number, the address of who they're paying, because if, if it's a fraud, then we can check back to see what he's doing. Now, the social media platform, similar to UK GDPR, uh, we've got to stop the fake ads. And it's this is a large issue because there's so many fake ads and the platforms make money from the adverts. I mean, the, the fraudsters don't mind paying for the adverts. So we need to work out something that brings the platforms onto line. And it could be part of the new online safety bill. Then finally, the cloud AI technology augmenting current text phone calls to show, hey, these are frauds. This is a chat, sorry, you can't say, the, 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 the chances are very high, this is a fraudster, and this pay is the fraudster. Uh, next slide. So it's, it really is, is time to act, and we need to cover 100% of the faster payments, and I put, pick out faster payments in particular, because there's only 36 bank members of the faster payment program. And these 36, for instance, uh, have agencies with other other people using faster payments. For example, PayPal uses faster payments. So if the bank is paying PayPal into your wallet, you then can buy cryptocurrencies. It's that simple. But the bank is not buying them. PayPal is, but the bank is allowing uh, PayPal to use that, which is fine except they've got to now check to see, you know, they've got to be much more stringent on whom they're paying. Also, we've got to mandate reimbursement programs for customers, vulnerable or not. There's a big thing about the FSA saying, we, we you know, the, the vulnerability, we must protect the vulnerable. <clears throat> but with digital fraud, I think we're all vulnerable because they, they're getting so clever, the fraudsters. And then we also need a, fir a firmer grip on the know your customer anti-money laundry because the existing banking regulators uh, should be encouraged to have the banks run annual or real-time checks because you can see a fraud that's taking place and you know you've got a limited time before he defrauds people, before he <coughs> disappears and opens another bank account. We're also going to tackle the frauds of supply chain by finding and shaming the social media platforms and we're going to shame them by saying this is what is happening. The telecom companies and the companies failing to stop products and data ended up on the dark web. And then finally the police and banks must work together on cyber digital fraud. I know it's it's hard because of traditional law and order <coughs> but uh, yeah, there's a stat that one percent of the police force is aimed at virtual uh, crypto and digital crime. Well, that's and <clears> that their training is is excellent for physical crime, 
but I think it needs another, if you like, uh, digital uh, crime working group to to work through and to bring more people to to court and to stop fraudsters because right now it's a it's open season against the public at this point in time. I do believe cyber digital current technology is a great enabler. Money moved in microseconds, goods delivered to your door, and like UK decimalisation in the year 2000, there's social, we're, we're in a society, it's in transition and it does need support by the government. Thank you. Better take myself off mute, John. Um, that was absolutely fascinating and terrifying by turns. Um, I can see we've got a lot of questions from our audience, but as chairman, the, the, the privilege of asking the first one falls to me. So you mentioned the poor take up of, of COP by, by British banks. Um, I recently did some research looking at high volume fraud in the UK, and it appears to me that our banks have very much abrogated responsibility for tackling fraud and, and, and pushed that responsibility onto the consumer. What do you think can be done to, to turn the tide? I, I think the banks themselves, uh, it's shown that they, they're, they're reluctant to do it. <clears throat> One, they, they'll always argue that we've got, <clears throat> they've got so much regulation on at this point in time, it's very hard for them to do it. And besides, when you take a look at the actual figures, I know it's one or two billion, but to the banks, that's not a lot of money. <laughs> that is it. And the consumers are treated really badly when they have a fraud because they're interrogated. They're not, oh, there's no sympathy. This, well, why do you allow this to happen, right? So, and uh, so there's no, the banks have to understand this, <clears throat> better understand their social requirements and also work better as, a, as an industry for the consumers. Uh, it's not so much in the corporate market because the corporate market have as good lawyers as the banks, right? It's, 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 it, the banks will settle quicker on the corporate fraud side than they will with the consumer. That's why there's so much channeling going to the financial officer. It's, 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 it's hard because uh, the banks, we need to, they have to have, it's mandatory. It, it, it can't not stay. It, the first APP for a size happened in 2015. There was an Exeter guy. He lost 47,000 pound because a couple of fraudsters who funny enough were uh, not in this country, took the money and the bank said, well, we checked and there's no money in the account. And it was, and then, slowly got round the criminal fraternity if you can put an HM, HMRC has got really hammered because people use oh you you owe us money please send it to this address here's HMRC and also the consumers themselves have got to really start to get serious about checking who they're paying because right but now, I've heard some some real horror stories, uh, particular with particularly with with people who are selling houses. They will receive an email purporting to be from their um, uh, solicitor a few days before the sale, uh, saying, "Oh, we've changed their bank account. Here are the new details," and they will pay hundreds of thousands of pounds into what appears to be a, a legitimate bank account, but it's actually a fraudulent bank account and the money disappears. I mean, these are life destroying events. Unfortunately, that is the case. And uh, if you, uh, we just bought a house about two years ago and the solicitors are really onto that. I mean, they make it really clear to you. Banks don't make it clear to you. They just, they don't sort of say, oh, this is the issue here. And for COP, a number of corporations are now using that to stop exactly that because there's there's a big case in the Netherlands when a, a French company changed the invoice. They thought it was from them and they lost about half a million pounds. So they said, okay, from now on, we're gonna check when you come in and check the COP on the request so it's it's starting to go well is this really the area so yeah it's it's and it's going on so long now that we we did a, uh, a uh, with the digital policy alliance 
we've got six banks faster payments uh, for a, a, a day. It was, and we found that you could stop uh, 70 to 80 percent of the frauds there and then. But the problem is that none of the banks cooperate. They don't. They don't share data, and it's like, well, and then they they put up the flag because we're to see the banks as well. And they say, oh no, it's data protection. And we went up to Chester to see the boys in Chester, and they said the last thing we want to do is support the criminal. So we want to support the the individual's rights, but at the same time we want to make certain the criminals are apprehended. And the banks, it's again, it, it goes. It's a mindset. I was in banking. 17 years and we had frauds but unfortunately we saw that as um uh erode your reputation so we just made them go away i mean we it, but now with technology they can't make them go there's too many of them i mean if we had in the in the early 90s if we had half a dozen frauds that was a lot now you get 10,000 attempts a day so that's it's the, the, the dynamics have changed and unfortunately, banks have old systems, so to make any changes, then uh, it takes a while to do that. So do you think it's, it's, there's a, a danger that if banks don't actually catch on to this and and and, and try and sort this out, they're at risk of of, of losing custom to to services such as PayPal? Because uh, you know, from personal experience, my my son was defrauded um, when he tried to buy a. Uh, one of these gaming systems, and uh, you know the, the 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 advert was fraudulent. But because he paid through PayPal, he was able to recover the funds. Um, so you know, are people going to increasingly turn to to PayPal and other payment services if if, if banks don't step up? Well, it's difficult. I got uh, on my credit report. I was told I had 29 years and four months of the Royal Bank of Scotland because. We don't change bank accounts. It's it's something in our DNA. So, you know, you call, uh, and I did made a faster payments, and I called faster payments uh, RBS. It took me forty five minutes to get through. Well, got COVID and all that stuff. So I knew if it was a fraud, my money had gone. Turns out my daughter had changed the account number, and he says, "Oh yes, 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 yes your daughter." The money did come into RBS, but not into the account it came into. I said, well, which account was that? He said, I can't tell you, sir. <laughs> so it's, 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 you know, it's, uh, and I was scared because I know the stats. You know, if, if you've sent your money, chances are within 10 minutes, it's gone. And then you read, you know, people who, when they call up the fraud departments, they take forever to answer the phone. It's, uh, and I think it's because you don't think about it. Nobody's thought about the, the, the setup of the payment system. Nobody said, "Well, how do we defraud it?" Nobody. And when they set it up without verifying the, the payee, I mean, that was like school era. So but how, do, how do fraudsters actually manage to set up so many bank accounts? Setting up a bank account is quite a, a you know, for for the average member of the public, is quite a, an involved and arduous uh, thing to do. How how come fraudsters seem to be able to to set up multiple bank accounts that you know they they you know they 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 dispose of once they've they've used them. Well, I think it's the uh, it's getting all the forms right. If you get all the forms right, you get a good story. You can get a bank account, and you and uh, the new banks haven't helped by increasing that. Now it's the adverts saying, "Oh, 450 quid, we'll open the bank, give you 150 quid if you own a bank account with us." Well, why not? So they're, they're encouraging them, but what what is failing is the actual real checking of of the data that's given to them, and that's a very interesting observation because the banks have done all the due diligence. You filled out form after form to get a bank account open, and then if I'm a fraudster, you know who I am, you know where I was, and you know the because they keep the track of all transactions for up to five seven years. Banks do so right there sitting there but nobody does anything about it because well, the, if, they're do, if they're doing due diligence and they know the address they've, they've they've confirmed the address of the owner of that bank account they must be able to to trace the fraudsters how comes that's not happening i think it's a combination the frauds are too small because the cost of investigation 
uh, according to UK finance, could be around £25,000 a case. Well, the average consumer fraud with APP is 3400 It's like, well, why do it? Do, the, do it, the banks share that information with the police, though? Do they actually say who the owner of that account is and give the address and, and the details, or, or are they holding on to that? No, if the police ask for it, they'll give it to them. They, they will. They, they are very cooperative with the police and with the Home Office. But, but the issue is that the police are overwhelmed with this. They've got 1% of their force doing it, and the cost of frauds are so small, their cost of investigation is closer to 50 grand. Right, so it's again, it's uneconomical. And then they set up this thing called action fraud, which turned out to be a scam <laughs> because you sent all the information there thinking something's going to happen and nothing happens, and, and the people there just fold it away. It's like, so it's, it's an issue that has to be addressed. It's an issue that you've got to tell this is how we're going to do this in this new but cyber digital world. This is how you've got to behave. And I'm a great believer because banks don't get on, right? Just because I was in America for 10 years and we just didn't get on with the other banks. It was just, just didn't happen. But we did bilateral agreements with other banks. So we didn't share it. So you need somebody who's going to work that bilateral aspect and uh, you need a, almost like a, a safety hub. Is this guy good and that kind of stuff. But until that happens, it will just carry. In fact, it will get worse because the technology and the uh, I, I mentioned the investment scam that allegedly was from uh, Jeremy Clarkson, and I filled out all the information there, and I've got 14 emails. I set up a special email account, and man, they are persuasive. John, have I got a deal for you? John, you your life's problems are now over. Your financial worries, you can forget about it. And it's kind and then next thing I know, they say, oh, that website doesn't work. Go to this website. You go to that website, it's like the old website. But they say, oh, there were so many people conned on that website. This is new, and this is this is the guy who has made a lot of money here. So once they get you, you're you're in trouble. And I did mm -hmm. like one time I uh, about a couple of years ago, I, there's a thing on text saying if you don't if you don't want to have any of these right stops. So I said stop. So I talked to my head of uh, fraud. He says you're mad because they know you know you're alive because <laughs> they sent out so many emails. They want to find that the people who are alive on those emails. So it was it was it was interesting. But the answer is it's it's a multifaceted. The you got to stop the it, it's so difficult and we've got to play all together the consumers got to play the bank's got to play the regulators got to play the government's got to play otherwise this is just going to carry on getting worse i'll be interested right. to see what the uk uh, uh, finance numbers are I, I put in projections in my graphs and that should be coming out in the next uh, four or five weeks and, we, and then you compare those to the graphs i've done and see how close or far i was from the actual numbers Right. Um, we've got a comment here saying that it's not true to say that all other banks don't use COP. Uh, many non-banks have or are implementing COP. So I think building societies uh, are, are beginning to move in that direction. No, that's true. Uh, no, that is in, true. There is, uh, let's have a look. Uh, another comment here, totally agree the FCA should be demanding real-time data sources uh for uh for tracking fraud there's there's plenty of providers of this tech and it would boost the reg tech sector so i think that's a, a very interesting point there is a a market opportunity here and, and and the government could actually encourage growth in this in this particular uh service um well, I, I, I happen to agree with that because the fraudsters are operating in one to two, two seconds right but our technology, you can do a tremendous thing in a microsecond. I mean, the whole thing is getting to the speed of light. And I think, I totally agree. I think that uh, the, the banks are encouraging tech, but it, it's always slower. It's it's not, you know, we've seen a lot more movement to, to real time because the banks historically, uh, it, it's batch process where you've got a lot. Yes, there is a lot of people committed to COP. And I know one or two major banks 
outside the six that are trying. And I said trying, it's not because they don't want to do it, it's because their technology is, is very old school. It's very uh, 20 years old. And now you've got to, and their data is all over the place. So you've got to pull this data together and try to do it in real time at that moment. And I think there's a, a big market, but it's, it's got to, it's got to be encouraged. And when you take a look as you get to the more senior in the bank, the technologists sort of drop away. And the, the, the I think they need somebody on the board that is responsible for cyber and digital safety. If I, you know, tell me who that person is, because when we bring out the, the numbers, and right now, the banks don't have to declare their actual numbers. Barclays have, Barclays says we reimburse 74% of the people. Uh, apart from TSB does 98, 98%, but the rest of them don't. And the fact is you got 40% reimbursed suggests those banks are under 40% because Barclays and TSB have got such a high number. And it's, 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 we're all in this together. That's the problem is, and it's, it's a multifaceted approach, but the banks have to get better at uh, saying, you know, it's be careful. And if, if we say, look, we don't think you should do it, and you do it, it should be you. You're liable. Yeah. So I, now I we've think got a, another comment here from a uh, lawyer who says that his firm has acted uh, for victims of fraud in a number of of, of uh, APP frauds, and they've successfully recovered funds. The law is increasingly moving in the direction of support for. Uh, the victims of fraud. What can banks do to to beef up their systems uh, in conjunction with some of the other points that you've you've raised? That's a very good question. I, I'm pleased uh, the lawyers get involved because it's a, the number of frauds rejected by the financial service obstacles clearly shows that the victims have a case. So I'm, I'm pleased the lawyers are doing that. Um, the banks have got to make it really clear and again from a legal point of view we've told you this looks like a fraud you go ahead we we'll tell you again reconfirm it a second time and then you, you override that then the liability goes back to you and actually it would have it'd be nice to have a, a legal opinion to say this is then you the, the client the responsible and you, the bank, if you don't do this, then you're responsible. And it shouldn't, and the, the responsible party should be the bank that owns the payee bank account, right? Because that's where the fraudster is, and that's where the fraudster lives in that bank. Okay, uh, right. If you were made prime minister for a day, no parties, um, <laughs> what three things would you do to uh, improve the current system? Your top three. Top three, I would establish a centre for, for fraud. There could only be a finite number of fraudsters. So you've got to establish with all the records the banks have got, you bring it into a centre, which is both run by the, <coughs> the Bank of England and the police. And you've got to find, you've got to have a broad czar, if you like, or a safety czar. Somebody, that's your responsibility. And you've got all this information, go and find the fraudsters. So that's dealing with the past. Going forward, the, the banks have to do COP, and they also have to do uh, information that identifies frauds of behavior within their, their bank accounts and also within the network. And they, there is one or two network players, uh, in the old days, it used to be Vocalink, where they had, but they've, they've, they've sold that to MasterCard. So that, that I'd set up, uh, uh, a sub, uh, a banking utility, a stroke police utility to do that. And the final thing is, I'll have a crack at all these social media platforms because they make the money off the adverts. And I did like GDPR; they can find up ten percent of the worldwide revenues. Right, I do like that. That's because I don't forget that ten years in America, it's not the money, but it's the money. <laughs> so that's that's what I do. Um, because of the cost involved in actually um, policing fraud, should banks be 
directly charged? Should should the police actually charge banks for for clearing up these these issues? Well, that's a, a great question, and it's a question of philosophy. We uh, spent a lot of time in I spent a lot of time in regulation and with the, the police. Banks don't want to be the world's policemen. They absolutely don't. They, they don't see that as their role. It's the police have to adapt to the new world we're in. The banks will do and provide the information. That's why when you pass questions, yeah, banks will give you the information, but you have to ask for it. But right. if the issue is is uh, if the issue is resources, banks have to pay for third party auditors. Why shouldn't they have to pay for for fraud investigations? Well, they do. They have their own fraud investigation. The problem is it's individuals. So all the clearing houses will have their fraud departments. Uh, all the little banks have their fraud departments, and the fraudsters love that because they just pick on the, the weakest links all the time. The, the, the small guys, you know, your frauds aren't going to be as good as the clearing house. Uh, HSBC has a whole division called financial crime, and uh, they do. The thing is, it's not organised. It's it's not. There's no. There's no group running across the banking industry and that may that may be a, a solution but I, I kind of trying to figure out how you do that with uh, you can have with, a, a market for fraud so actually pay private contractors to to track down and uh, I nearly said eliminate I didn't mean that uh, and uh, uh, prosecute frauds um, you know you, you could set booby traps for them spear phishing attacks etc so actually go on the offensive rather than the defensive to, to make fraud unprofitable i happen to totally agree with the offense i've been so long in america we use offense a lot and uh, i remember at one meeting with the forces i suggested uh, sorry the bank investigator i suggested the offense and they i it was a strange behaviour. I knew we, I was in a different culture. It was fraud was always pacify and it, no, no, we've got a problem here. Let's go and find out the root of the problem and let's deal with it. And I think that we we are not in the capability of doing that because each bank does its own investigation. Yes, it does hand it over to the police, but then you've got to take it to the court. And I think the uh, I did like the lawyer's suggestion that uh, we are getting better adapted the, the case uh, I, can, I can see i'm getting signals now we have run out of time i'm afraid that time has caught up with us ladies and gentlemen I know that some of you still got questions to ask please do contact john to continue this discussion you can email us and we'll pass your 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 questions on we're also going to be posting uh recording the presentation online in the next couple of days so you can revisit what john has said it just remains for me to thank members of the FS Club for making today possible. I'd also urge you to keep an eye on our forthcoming events page for more webinars, which include finance and the fishing industry post Brexit on the 20th of April, a journey to operational resilience on the 21st of April and nature as the next wave on the 26th of April. Uh, you can catch up with all our previous webinars on our YouTube channel and our new Pizzazz TV channel. Um, we hope to see you again soon. Please stay safe. Uh, goodbye.